I'm Shweta Bhagwat and I'm and I work in Sapienza University of Rome. Today I'm going to talk about black hole ringdowns and black hole spectroscopy in the context of laser data. When two black holes in spiral around each other and merge, they first form a distorted black hole, which then rings down and settles into a final stable state, which according to GR is a black hole. In this process, it emits gravitational waves known as the ring down. A ring down comprises of the last few milliseconds of a binary black hole signal observed during a binary black hole coalescence. Um, so this part of the signal probes the space-time very close to the black hole and contains inferences of um, the nature of black hole as well as the dynamics of the space-time close to the black hole. Therefore, it's a very important tool for conducting tests of GR. A binary black hole ring down has a simple description in the context of perturbation theory. It can be described as evolution of perturbation on the space time of the final black hole that is formed. The waveform is rather simple and is composed of superposition of damped sinusoids with characteristic frequency and damping time. These frequencies and damping time are characteristic to the mass and spin of the black hole and are unique to that mass and spin of the black hole. Uh, the amplitude and the phase, on the other hand, are decided by the initial condition that is set during the in-spiral and during the merger. So the form of the ring down waveform is given on the slide. Now, there are two kinds of quasi-normal modes. The ones that, that have different angular dependencies are separated into angular modes and are decomposed into the corresponding spheroidal harmonic basis, which is written as YLM in the slide. L and M are the indices that are used to label these modes, just like in quantum mechanics. And then for each of these angular modes, there are overtones, which are like harmonics, and these are mentioned, uh, mentioned these are indexed with the index N. Measuring the quasi-normal mode frequency and damping time in a black hole ring down is what is called as the black hole spectroscopy. Black hole spectroscopy is a very important tool for testing strong field GR because um, it allows you to check if the prediction, analytical prediction, is consistent with what is observed. If you can measure more than one quasi-normal mode, then you can perform tests of consistency of whether or not the mass and the spin inferred by, com by combination of two different parameters, like two frequencies and a damping time, for instance, are consistent with each other. So black hole spectroscopy has been used in slightly different contexts in the literature, so I shall begin first by defining what I mean by black hole spectroscopy for this talk. Uh, by black hole spectroscopy, I mean that we should be able to test for the presence of the second mode. We should be able to resolve the frequency and the damping time of the subdominant mode from the dominant mode. And then third, we should be able to measure the frequency of both the dominant and the subdominant mode with certain ac accuracy. Now, this might require a slightly large, larger amount of SNR, signal-to-noise ratio in the ring down. Alternatively, what, alternatively, there are other tests such as the in-spiral merger ring down consistency test, where you check if the mass and spin of the black hole predicted by the ring down is consistent with the whole waveform, the whole gravitational wave waveform. Uh, there, is, there are also null tests where you look at the ring down and search for the presence of uh, frequencies, frequency contents that are unexpected. So these things can be done with a slightly smaller SNR ring down. So, so we consider the question of what is the minimum SNR that's required in the ring down to be able to perform the black hole spectroscopy as defined in my previous slide. So during a binary black hole ring down, the L equal to M equal to 2 mode is the dominant mode because of the symmetry that happens during the merger phase. In our study, we considered we considered two subdominant angular modes, uh, L equal to 2, M equal to 1, and L equal to M equal to 3. These are the two loudest subdominant angular modes uh, for non-spinning initial binaries. And then we consider one overtone, which is L equal to M equal to 2, N equal to 1, one overtone of the dominant mode. We perform studies for mass ratio of initial binaries from equal mass, that is 1, q equal to 1, to a mass ratio of q equal to 10. Uh, we perform an analysis using a Fisher matrix setup, which is valid generally in a higher SNR limit. 
Next, we calculate the Fisher matrix spread sigma for the amplitude ratios, the phase differences, and the frequency and damping time of the quasi-normal modes in the ring dam. Um, we impose detectability criteria which in which we demand that the uncertainty in the recovery of the amplitude ratio of um, amplitude ratio should be such that it excludes zero. Essentially, we ask that amplitude ratio should be non-zero for confidently detecting the presence of the second mode. Then we impose resolvability criteria, which is the standard Rayleigh resolvability criteria. Here we ask that the peak of the subdominant mode frequency should be further away from one sigma of uncertainty of recovery of the dominant mode frequency. Uh, next we ask for measurability criteria in which we ask that we should be able to measure the frequency and the Q of both the dominant and the subdominant mode with a given accuracy, which in this case we mention as T. Uh, we have done this analysis for T of 1%, 5%, and 10%. Next, we ask the question of what is the minimum SNR required in the ring down so that we can satisfy all of the three conditions that we mentioned before. Um, this result is shown in the graph on this on the slide. On the x-axis is the mass ratio of the progenitor binary system. And on the y-axis, we show the minimum SNR in the ring dump re required to satisfy all of these three conditions. The left panel corresponds to dominant mode frequencies, Qs, and subdominant mode frequency. And the right panel corresponds to dominant mode frequency and Q, and subdominant mode Q. Now, the thing to notice over here is that for an equal mass binary system, it's very hard to do black hole spectroscopy. Uh, and Q is equal to 1, you see that for performing black hole spectroscopy, you require exponentially large SNR for angular modes, and you require about an SNR of 100 to perform black hole spectroscopy using overtones. Um, at around 1 point, Q is equal to 1.2, we see that the angular mode takes over, and that takes over the overtone, and we can start performing black hole spectroscopy using the subdominant mode frequency uh, with an SNR of around 50 to 60. Uh, we also want you to notice that doing spectroscopy with frequency requires frequency of the subdominant mode requires much lower SNR compared to that with um, subdominant mode Qs. So these signal to noise ratios and ring down are routinely achievable with LISA, and, and hence it's essential to be able to model the ring down waveform uh, accurately. Um, so the way we model the amplitude and the phases of these different quasi-normal mode excitations is by fitting uh, damp sinusoids to numerical relativity data. One of the important things over here is when we start fitting these numerical relativity simulations. Um, so first we try to investigate this for the angular modes. In the figure that we show here, uh, we show in blue the fitting of amplitude and phase for the 210 mode and in red for 330 mode. You see there are two kinds of lines here. There are, there are solid lines which corresponds to the amplitudes that are fitted from 10m after the peak of the numerical waveforms, and the dashed lines which corresponds to the fitting that starts at 15m after the peak of the, of the numerical waveforms. On the x-axis is the mass ratio of the progenitor system, and on the y-axis is the amplitude ratio and the phase. Now the thing to notice over here is that there is not so much difference between the dashed lines and the solid lines, indicating that whether you fit from 10m or 15m, your amplitude ratio remains stable. So angular modes are robust to the choice of the start time of fitting for amplitude and phase. Now, uh, one thing to notice over here is the amplitude ratio I'm quoting here are the rescaled amplitude ratio. That is, we have scaled it back of what it would be if we extended the waveform to the time, at, time of merger. Okay. Now we do the same for the overtones. For overtones, modeling the amplitude and phases are slightly more harder because the overtones are very short-lived. In the figure that you see on this page, you see the gravitational waveform starting from the merger onwards till the die, and you see a couple of vertical lines. These vertical lines correspond to the half-life of the decay of the overtones. The one that we are interested in is the yellow line, which corresponds to n is equal to 1 overtone, which is what we are interested in. Uh, and you see how quickly it dies. It dies in the first quarter of the gravitational wave cycle. So this makes it very hard to calibrate the amplitude and phase. However, we do see that this can be done and it's reproducible. The second question that we are interested in is the fact that since these are very short-lived, our assumption of whether or not these 
overtones start simultaneously really matter in terms of modeling the amplitude and phase. And we do not have an answer for this yet. For all our analysis, we assume that all of the overtones start simultaneously. And this is a question for future investigation. Uh, and the third thing is that we find that the number of modes that are included in the number of overtones that are included in modeling affects the amplitude that's, that each overtone is calibrated with. So we do need to find an answer to how many overtones do we have to add in order to get a reliable uh, waveform. Now we assume that the ringdown is composed of the dominant mode and just a single subdominant overtone, n is equal to 1, and that both of these start simultaneously. Then we try to uh, look at the effect of the start time on the fitting of amplitude ratio and the phase difference by calibrating these to the numerical relativity waveform. As in the previous case, we are reporting the amplitudes that is rescaled. Re Here you see four lines in this plot. Correspond the green one corresponds to the fitting done at merger. The red one corresponds to the fitting done at merger plus 5m. The blue to merger plus 10m and the yellow to merger plus 15m. What you see here is that, unlike in the case of angular modes, for overtones, depending on where you start the fitting, the amplitude ratio changes significantly. As in, the three color, the four colors curve don't overlap with each other for both phase and the amplitude. Overtone amplitude and phases are dependent on the start time, and hence it's very important to investigate on what is a good starting point to fit these uh, overtones. So now we take one particular numerical simulation which is uh, SXS0305, which corresponds to the GW1509-14 system. And we investigate the overtone fitting. So we do two different kinds of tests. One, where we try to find how does the rescaled amplitude of the subdominant overtone, n is equal to 1 overtone, changes with different start time. This is given in the figure where you see the red and the green dots. All of these are rescaled so that they report the amplitude at merger, so they are re-exponentiated backwards. Um, and what you see is the blue dots that corresponds to the amplitude of the dominant mode is stable. So the x-axis tells you the different start time of fitting, and the y-axis tells you the amplitude. Uh, you see that the green line stabilizes, whereas the red line, which corresponds to the amplitude of the first overtone, does not stabilize. It stabilizes only after 20m, which is where the overtone is tied. So depending on where you start to fit, you get different amplitudes. This is similar and consistent with what we just saw in the previous slide. So essentially this tells you that we have to be very careful about where we begin fitting the amplitudes of overtones. Next we see how the, how the number of overtones contained in a ringdown affects the fitting. What we do is we now fit for seven overtones, unlike the previous case where we're fitting only for two overtones, and we see the correlation in the amplitude between the, ampli between the different fit amplitudes. So this is the correlation mat matrix of the fit. So redder the area is on this graph, larger the correlations are. So what we see is that in the beginning for the n is equal to 1 and n is equal to 2 uh, overtones, the correlations are not much. But as you increase the number of overtones, these amplitudes are all correlated to each other. You, you find a non-negligible amount of power in the correlation matrix. So we have to be careful about how many overtones we add into our, our analysis. So as a concluding note, I would like to emphasize that we need to model the ring down amplitudes and phases of different angular modes and overtones accurately so that we can do an optimum black hole spectroscopy with the soon to come golden laser data. Um, some of the questions we would need to address are um, how many overtones do we want to include for the dominant mode? Do we want to include overtones for the subdominant mode? When do we start the start time for the analysis of black hole spectroscopy? Um, and do we allow these modes to start simultaneously or will each of them uh, have different start times? These are the questions we will need to figure out answers to in the future. Uh, we will try. We will be extending our analysis for the 440 angular mode and the 550 angular mode, which will be relevant to the LISA data, because LISA will be able to detect these uh, angular modes as well. We are also trying to fold in information about the supermassive black hole population into our studies to see how regularly we will be able to detect multimodal black hole spectroscopy. 
and with that i conclude my talk thank you very much